He is currently chairman and chief executive officer of Golden ABC Inc., more popularly known as the Pen Shop Group, which also includes brands such as Oxygen, Memo, For Me, Regatta, and Boku. He is also group chairman of Golden ABC's holding company, LH Paragon Inc., and sits on the board of PLDT and Card MRI Group's Mga Dika Ni Inay. He was also a longtime board director and former chairman of the Philippine Retailers Association. With us some thought leaders, please welcome Bernie Liu. Good to see you, Bernie. Thank you so much Good for joining to be here. us. Kathy, thank you for having me. Well, when was the last time we had a chat? I mean, that was during oh, the pandemic yes. and it was a Zoom conference. Yes, I, I, I remember, remember it perfectly. We didn't know what was happening. We didn't know what we were doing, but we had to get on with business. Yes, yes. In hindsight, 2020, it's always perfect. So what are the learnings? What are the takeaways that you may want to share at this point? Well, those were difficult years, definitely. And uh, I guess in hindsight, it was a chance to go back to basics. We had the opportunity to slow down. Well, I guess uh, we were forced to slow down, but it gave us the opportunity to step back a bit and look at what was important to us as a company. Uh, while we were all grappling with what was happening, uh, we wanted to make sure that our people knew what was happening and where we were heading. So we had a chance to revisit our vision, revisit our purpose, revisit our core values. We added a fifth core value, which was uh, stewardship. Uh, I guess it was timely because uh, seeing through the pandemic, it was important that we wanted to know our end game, at least as far as uh, what we thought we would like to be. So and what was that end game? Looking back, do, do, do you think you made the right decision, slow down, step up, yeah, put we, in stewardship? Yeah, true. Well, uh, the pandemic, as, as, as most retailers face, we were all forced to close down. Uh, the pandemic didn't allow us to open our shops. So it was an opportunity for us. Of course, after the dust has settled, after taking care of our employees, after taking care of our suppliers, our business partners, we had to step back a little bit and ask, what exactly do we really want to come out after this pandemic? And then during that time, nobody knew how long it was going to take. A year, two years, some say, oh, let's just wait it out for a year. We decided that, you know, we, nobody had a crystal ball. Nobody had a, you know, nobody had a playbook of what was going to happen. So we decided, why don't we use this time to reassess, ask ourselves, is our vision still real? Is our purpose still relevant to us? Uh, what do we want to change? That was a good opportunity for us. So looking back, yes, uh, after the dust has settled, I think we did the right thing. And if someone were to walk into your shop today, three years after the pandemic, when mobility is restored, people are coming back to shopping malls where yes. you're mostly located, what will they see? How different? will the pen shop brand be to the one who's gone to your shop pre-pandemic and to the one who again visits it? Well, definitely we're much larger now. Our stores pre-pandemic, we were, we, we were in that phase and stage where we wanted to expand our stores. But then, then the pandemic happened, we decided that you know, we're not gonna shelf that. We're gonna probably defer some of it, but uh, for our customers, they will see fresher merchandise the pandemic allowed us to also clean a lot of our old merchandise because, well, supply was not coming in, people were not shopping, and our shops were closed for months at a time. Of course, like any merchandise, it has a shelf life. So while our stores were closed, our merchandise was aging as well. Not, not any of it our fault, but it was aging. Time moved on. Uh, time did not stop during the pandemic. So we had a chance to do some house cleaning and allowed us to bring, bring in fresher merchandise, allowed us to make our merchandise more relevant. We introduced a lot of home home products uh, that is now still very well patronized by our, by our customers. So That's they, 37 years and counting. Uh, 37 the, years the and counting this year. The last time you celebrated your 35th year at the height of the pandemic, <laughs> and now it's 37 years. So yes. I'm, I'm counting the number of crises that you've gone 
gone through. I mean, you've started in 86, so that was people power. You know, yes. No one will forget that. Uh, but then you had to go through the Asian financial crisis of 1998 and then the 2008-09 global financial crisis. I mean, one would understand that this is all financial related, but when it comes to the pandemic, that's that's really non-financial. So how, how would you say you survived and thrived in this particular event, very disruptive event, versus the ones that you survived in the past that were financially related? As you said, Kathy, it was financial related, but this, this crisis was more than just financial, although financial played a big part of it. It was a human crisis. It was a human tragedy. And as such, uh, there was, again, there was no playbook. I had to rely on our 37 years or 35 years. That became my playbook. <laughs> uh, many people would say, oh, there was no playbook for this pandemic. But in hindsight, actually, I did. I, I, you know, I had 35 years to look into as my playbook. So uh, because it was a human crisis, of course, we had to prioritize our people. We had to prioritize uh, what was happening to them because they were as much victims as the businesses are. So we had to take care of them, take care of our suppliers, take care of the people that work with us. But more importantly, I think uh, we overcommunicated. I think in this during this crisis, uh, if there's one thing that I did really uh, exaggerate was the communication part of things. Uh, I didn't know what was happening. We didn't know what was happening, but uh, let alone our people. So we really overcommunicated. We kept them abreast of what was happening, uh, other than what they were seeing and hearing in the news, but uh, what we as a company were doing, what we had to go through, uh, what our plans were, and more importantly, asking them what their thoughts are. How, how are they doing? Uh, what ideas can they, can they put forward? You know, a lot of the innovation that happened during the crisis, actually the ideas came from our people. It was, well, we, 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 uh, we, are, you know, we articulated our thoughts, we articulated our sentiments, we encouraged, uh, you know, we had ideas, but most of the ideas came from our people. They were the ones telling us, you know, sir, you know, we should be doing this, we should be doing that. So. Uh, we overcommunicated, Kathy, and so I think that's important. That's it. It's interesting that you mentioned innovation coming from your own people, uh, keeping them informed, and at the very same time, them contributing to what goes next, what we will take forward. What have you retained in those innovative ideas from your people now that we're back to mobility and we're talking digital in a way, physical and digital? <laughs> Yeah. Where we'll get to later on because that's really the, the most contentious part, I would presume, in the retailing industry post-pandemic. Well, one thing for certain that we didn't forget our customers. The, our frontline people, 5,000 of them, were the one, uh, you know, were the, our frontliners. They were the ones facing our customers. And they were the ones reminding us of uh, you know, what our customers' needs were. Even our customers, some of them didn't know what they wanted. They, they, they were as well grappling, but uh, well, the, the customer centricity was never neglected. Uh, how we could do things simpler. You know, before the pandemic, Kathy, we had a program we called FAST, FAST. Well, not because we're in fast fashion. I, I refuse to label ourselves as fast fashion. But, so uh, it you was label a, yourself? Well, fashion, it's a fashion company. Uh, well, sometimes fast has a negative connotation that it's uh, disposable fashion. We don't consider ourselves to be that. But uh, before the pandemic, we had this program we call FAST, it was our acronym for frugality, agility, simplicity, and teamwork. Uh, we were in a hyper growth mode before the pandemic. We were expanding, we were opening 100 shops a year. We were, you know, we were just so busy. Uh, we didn't have time to pause. We didn't have time to rethink what we were doing. But the pandemic forced us to, to slow down, as I said earlier. And, and it was timely because uh, the pandemic required us to be frugal. The pandemic required us or demanded us to be agile. It required us to, to simplify a lot of things and to encourage collaboration and teamwork. 
So while the while the the concept was there before the pandemic, it was during the pandemic that we really uh, tested it. We stress test what we were trying to roll out, and a lot of it uh, required a lot of our people's cooperation, and a lot of the things that we wanted to do actually came from them. Okay, many suggested we can do this. We can cut this process. We can shorten it. We can serve our customers better by reducing, eliminating some of the other processes. So it was making things a bit simple. Of course, cost savings as well. And uh, our ability to pivot, uh, especially when all, all our shops were closed, we had to pivot to e-com. And of course, while we had e-com before uh, the pandemic happened, uh, it uh, kind of accelerated a lot of things. And how is that pivot or repivoting happening right now? What is maybe the ideal ratio between the physical store revenues and what you get online? Well, we were mostly brick and mortar stores before the pandemic. Our e-commerce business was what, a measly 2%, 3% share of business. But I guess that changed during the pandemic. It became the other way when all our physical stores were closed. So we were purely dependent on the e-commerce. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, good thing we were doubling into it before the pandemic. But even then, so we, we went through, we made a lot of mistakes. We went through uh, and on the learning process at the height of the pandemic. And we grew the business. It kind of saved uh, a bit although it couldn't replace the brick and mortar then, but it did help us carry forward, carry us through the, that period. Uh, now, uh, while the, when the brick and mortar stores are now fully opened, uh, our e-commerce has not slowed down, uh, albeit it's you know, tempered a bit. It's still growing, but not at the pace of the, uh, during, the, during the case of the pandemic, during the time of the pandemic. But it's still growing, but uh, our brick and mortar is now back. So worldwide, I think for most of the more advanced retailers, they would say their e-commerce would be about 20%. We would be slightly lower. We're now back to about 10, 10 to 15% of our business would be e-commerce. Uh, we have been able to maintain that and uh, the rest would, would be brick and mortar, physical stores. And you'll feel confident that this will be the ratio a little bit lower than global average and still make a lot more money with a brick and mortar setup? Well, we will have to see how it goes, but we are very comfortable where we are. Uh, our back processes, our systems have been able to support that. Uh, any change in the ratio, I think we would be able to adapt well uh, because in the during the pandemic, we also uh, shifted to our new uh, distribution center which uh, we uh, opened or we inaugurated and we operated and activated during the pandemic. It's the first in the country, Kathy. Uh, we use a lot of robotics, pretty much like what you use here in the studio. And uh, unfortunately, we could not uh, fly in all our foreign consultants because there was a lockdown and you know, there was, uh, the borders were closed. So we had to rely on uh, equipments or, or TV cameras to help our people on the ground on how to build and you know, activate the new uh, distribution center. It helped us, us a lot during the pandemic. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to pivot well to our e-commerce business. But talk to us next about what, how that impacted the jobs or labor. Uh, had you been able to upskill or reskill just before the automation came in? And what's happened next? What kinds of jobs or more qualitative jobs were you able to give your people from the automation yeah. that's resulted? Well, a lot of engineers, a lot of knowledge workers, uh, definitely our, our physical stores didn't change much except for uh, again upgrading our physical and our digital uh, technology. But uh, the changes really happen a lot on the back office, wherein we use a lot of data. We use a lot of data analytics. We use a lot of automation to be able to support the needs of the stores and the needs of our customers. So yes, uh, upscaling was, uh, was a given uh, and continue to do so. We continue to prepare our people now to, to really embrace 
uh, technology to really embrace uh, data analytics, moving to, into artificial intelligence eventually and predictive analytics and all of this. So yeah, that's, that's been going on. Our company has been doing that even long before the pandemic, but it was just simply accelerated during the pandemic. So that means you've gotten a head start in terms of collecting the data trail, which yes. is so important right now in discovering who the new pandemic evolved shopper is especially the Filipino shopper. What are you finding in that data trail so far with what you've co accumulated pre-pandemic and during the pandemic and how that's evolved? And how are you serving right now that kind of a shopper that you're finding in the data? Customers are, you know, shoppers right now are more discerning, are more discriminating. They have the world now at, the finger, at their fingertip. They, 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 they can browse the internet they can see what's uh, what's in, what's out, what's available. So this is the kind of shopper that we have to contend with. And this is the kind of intelligent shoppers that we have today. And we have to be able to understand them. And that's why we had to adapt. Uh, a lot of the customers right now, uh, you know, there's no brand loyalty. Because unlike before, like, you know, they're... they're their information to what brand, what products to buy were a bit limited. But with today's technology, I think, you know, the world is at their fingertip, right? So they normally shop, they browse online, they find what, what suits them. And uh, they're, the customers now are not truly, I won't say that they're not brand loyal, but they just have so much choices now. So it's our ability as retailers now to really get into their minds and their, and their shopping behavior. And a lot of the customers now uh, don't just shop on, on offline. They browse online, they shop offline, they, you know, they, they, it's a combination of, uh, as you said, digital, uh, you know, uh, retails. That's, that's really, that's really uh, how the, the customers are now behaving. So. Are you finding that there are more consumers now who are consummating the purchase on site? Or are there more who, who actually browse online and then fulfill the transaction online? They, they do that. Uh, a lot of them are, they, sh they browse online, they shop online, and they have their goods delivered to their houses. And that's, you know, that's one, one aspect of the customers. And uh, that's pure online. Uh, a lot of our customers, too, uh, browse online, and they try to see wh where they can buy uh, the, the goods. We have uh, what we call our omni-channel option. They can browse online and uh, choose which stores they want to have uh, those products that they want to uh, you know, available in what store. And they, they normally go to the small. So they, you know, somebody from Davao, for instance, or somebody from Cebu can uh, browse through our website and they will tell this and then they get to choose which branch they want to pick up the goods uh, from. Or maybe even decide whether to purchase it because they'd like to have a feel, you yes. know, have a look, and maybe even try it even yes. before they buy it. Yes. So and that's how discerning they become. Uh, that's how online and offline business have become more borderless, uh, Kathy. Like customers nowadays, they don't just go to the store to browse. They can browse anywhere. They can shop anywhere, anytime. They can browse uh, the products at midnight and decide to shop you know, the following week and so on and so forth. So it's making our products available anywhere, anytime. So that's, that's how the, uh, you know, the consumers are now behaving. Let me pick up on brand loyalty because I know that pre-pandemic and everyone knows uh, Penshop Group has really harnessed the power of global talent to draw people in. You've had uh, endorsers such as Zac Efron, One Direction, going way back to Josh Bowman, <laughs> Lee yes. Meester. We've, we've uh, seen them on, on the ads, on the OOH, the um, out-of-home ads. Are you going to continue that strategy, given that we've become borderless? Has that become more important to the whole business strategy? Or are you changing that? Well, what's important, Kathy, we always listen to our customers. Uh, you know, right now, if you look at uh, most of a lot of our endorsers, a lot of them are Korean uh, uh, popular uh, K-drama or K-pop stars. 
because that is what our customers uh, uh, are affiliated with right now. But there was a period in time that uh, a lot of the Western endorsers were also very popular. Uh, One Direction, you mentioned One Direction. We had all the, uh, you know, all the uh, supermodels uh, also as our, our endorsers then, from Gigi Hadid to Bella Hadid to, to, to Kendall Jenner. And, uh, but I think, I think uh, the trust of having popular endorsers uh, represent the brand is a pride for Filipino brands like ours. To have them say yes to a Filipino or proprietary brand like ours it's a pride that I think we should uh, we should harness, and we should be you know, we should embrace. Uh, pretty much like a lot of the uh, popular stars from Korea right now are you know are endorsing our brands, and I think that will continue because uh, brand brand affinity and brand affiliation sometimes is also determined by how you communicate your brand position to the use of the different endorsers. We have many brands, uh, obviously Pencha being the the, the biggest probably has more resources to to tap on the global endorsers, but our other brands uh, do have very relevant endorsers as well that uh, represents the brand well, and it's the it's our ability now to connect with our customers uh, uh, based on the brand position that uh, we carry. You mentioned earlier that you had no playbook. And I was thinking back then, you, you dug into 35, 37 years of what, what you experienced, but you dug deep with your family. It is a family business. Pen Shop Group essentially is and is run by your wife, Alice, who recently got promoted as president and chief operating officer of Golden ABC. And since March, she'd also been managing marketing and uh, your son, mm -hmm. your son, Brian, been very busy as VP for strategy and operations, all about e-commerce, uh, supply chain, business transformation, all the things we probably will want to think about when it's the future today. I'm just wondering how the dynamic is like in the family now that it's its second, third generation, who's now playing a big part in the future of retail. How are decisions made and what kinds of ideas come through and get to be decided on? I am a second generation, Kathy. My, my late father and my mom started the business over 50 years ago. We were in diverse industries. In manufacturing, uh, in Manufacturing, fact. we were in the wood, we're in the wood business. We still are, uh, no, we, we, it's a diverse group. Uh, fashion retail is one of them. Uh, that's where Pen Shop belong. Uh, I took over from my mom in the 90s, 80s. I'm second generation. My, my wife was with me through this journey, Alice. So she has helped me shape what Golden ABC is today. So rightfully, she deserves to take the driver's seat now as I focus on more uh, on the other businesses of the group. And of course, we're enticing the third generation. My son, Brian Eldest, is... Uh, doubled into e-commerce, digital marketing long before the pandemic. So I'm fortunate that my children have decided to come home and uh, help in the business. Uh, and uh, we, we need the younger talents. We need the young blood, uh, Kathy, to help propel the business forward. Basically, since a lot of our customers are also young like them, my second son and my daughter, my second son, Brandon, my daughter, Mandy, started Boku during the pandemic. And they have transformed the brand to what it is now. My second son is now the head of the bigger brand, Pen Shop. But uh, it's, the, it's the passion, the, 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 the digital native of the young nowadays that uh, we need to help propel the business forward. While the elders, like, uh, like myself, provide the wisdom we need the energy and the youth of the young to understand the market, to understand the way businesses are operated now, especially with the digitalization, especially the need to pivot towards you know, the fourth industrial revolution. We, we need the young. Uh, the, the elders will still be there. We will be there uh, to advise them. But uh, I'm happy to see the third generation getting involved. Uh, it is now their time to, to shine. So does that mean that anything they propose gets 
voted on by the elders or do the elders kind of push back and say, let's be a little bit more conservative? I mean, how, what's the yeah. dynamic like in the I world? was allowed to make a lot of mistakes when I was their age. I believe that our children or the young ones should be allowed to to explore and make well it's it's no mistakes are not uh, intentional but they have to be allowed to experiment and uh, as long as our core values are aligned our vision our shared our shared future is clear to them uh, whether they're family members or they're professionals i think the value system is important uh, we have a common shared price future, they know what we needed to do, uh, that will become our North Star. And I think uh, young people, whether they're family or not, should be given the chance to express their ideas, their thoughts, and should be allowed to own certain things uh, in, uh, at work. Yeah. Or perhaps promote like stewardship. Let me get back to that because that's really something new. Uh, was that for them? Did you create that pillar for them? Well, my father has always uh, espoused that, you know, whatever we do now, we're doing it for the next generation. I think the concept of stewardship allows us to look at things on a longer horizon. We're not doing things just for ourselves. We're not doing things for this generation, but rather taking care of the entrusted resource given to us so that we can hand them on better to the next generation. And I think stewardship is important because it reminds all of us that Whatever we do now is not ours to just for us to harvest, but to pay it forward, to be able to grow the business, to be able to grow the enterprise so that uh, we can give back to the future generation uh, the same opportunities that was given to us. Well, let me pick up on sustainability because that's, that's the big thing in fashion, sustainable fashion. I mean, that's not really work out. Pre-pandemic, a lot of the, the brands and the fashion houses were big, they were big on sustainability, but is it just lip service? Or do you think that that's progressed post-pandemic, that a lot more thought has gone in? And not only that, not a lot of thought, but boots hitting the, uh, the road there. I mean, really walking the talk. I think it's a work in progress, Kathy. I don't think there's, there's no turning back, actually. Sustainability is a, is a necessity. Uh, because sustainability, stewardship is, you know, they're, they're connected. We cannot be good stewards if we cannot take care of the gift and the resources that were entrusted to us. So I think during the pandemic, that kind of took uh, you know, a back seat because you know, things were different than uh, with us all about survival. But I think moving forward, sustainability should be, should be pursued. Uh, in our case, you know, uh, there's a lot of you know, initiatives about recycling, about using, uh, you know, using recycled materials and so on and so forth. But one of the things that I've always emphasized, and I, I think I've shared this in the past, and I, I keep on sharing this to our people, is that the most basic thing we need to do as a fashion company is to minimize waste. I mean, we can talk about sustainability, we can talk about all these recycling programs, but nothing comes close to the wasted resources that were used just for us to dump our excess merchandise or excess inventory in the dump sites. And uh, nothing comes close to the wasted resources uh, other than to, you know, to emphasize on waste first. Let's minimize waste. Let's produce only or let's buy only what we can sell and uh, it starts with that the most basic I, I think even during the pandemic i did emphasize we need to, to we need to go back to basics right so waste uh, let's talk about waste when we talk about sustainability and in our company uh, it's important that we do not overbuy or overproduce something that we cannot sell because merchandise have shelf life and when you know when it's time you you know and you cannot sell them anymore where does it go it go to the it, go, it goes to the dump sites it goes to you know all this recycling effort and there's more resources used to recycle all the excess inventory so we have to start there we have to start with uh, you know, the concept of managing waste interesting you mentioned that because in an economist article i came across and th this was back in 2021 and it really riveted me because it's it's a new acronym it's called c2m 
consumer to marketing, consumer to manufacturer, where the big data, the artificial intelligence, uh, plays into tech platforms to identify the latest shopping trends. And not only that, to identify how much of this material is needed or how much of this particular garment is needed and is delivered directly to the consumer, thus reducing waste, excess inventory buffers, improving margins, everything you wanted in, in the future of retail. Are we anywhere close to that in, I, in the Philippines? Yeah. Uh, is there a supply chain where we can actually depend on, or at least the data that you've already amassed with the automation you've begun? For the more progressive companies, uh, you really have to start with the most basic of, uh, which is data. You really have to have uh, the right information to make the right decision. And without data uh, aiding you, without you know, this massive amount of data or information that flows through our ecosystem, uh, it's difficult to talk about sustainability if you do not even know, you know your numbers. And uh, in our company, we've, we've been obsessed with data a long, you know, even before the turn of the century. I've always believed, I'm, I'm an architect, Kathy, so yes. uh, I just don't design beautiful products, but I am also, as, you know, I also put a lot of things on science, not just the art side of things. And uh, data is the science part of what we do in, in retail. And that requires a lot of data, that requires a lot of analysis and, and a lot of data crunching that will allow us to make better decisions. You know, allows us to, to determine what will the customer want, where do they want it, when do they want it, how much do they want of it. So all of that is really hinged on data, on our ability to, to use data now to be able to you know, minimize unnecessary inventory, improve margins, allow us to give our customers the right merchandise at the right time, at the right place, at the right price. Because again, price plays an important role in determining that. So, yeah. So, so are I we think, anywhere think, near China? I because that example I gave is in China. It's already happening there. Oh, well, they're CTM. more advanced. I think they. They skipped the analog uh, they era. <laughs> they went straight to di digital. But I think we will get there. I think uh, you know, our country and our businesses are well, you know, are, are ready to embrace uh, that. It, it, it will take time. But I think for companies, progressive companies that are already doing it, it's really a matter of uh, accelerating it and uh, putting in more resources to, to, yeah, to go deeper into uh, data analytics. And also being mindful of prices. You keep mentioning price as really an important point that we should bring up because cost is another challenge whenever you talk about stewardship, sustainability, sustainable fashion. It's really the millennials and the Gen Z um, who, who look at your products, uh, what you offer and the kinds of brands. Uh, but they're, they may be supportive, but they probably won't have the money just yet to purchase what they see as something they'd like to, but might not be at the price point that they'd want to. So how do you convince the millennials and the Gen Z that it's worth the purchase? Well, it's a given, Kathy, the young people do not have the, the, the kind of disposable income, I suppose, as, as, as opposed to those who are working. But price plays an important role. That's why as companies, it's important that we really look at our value chain. We look at the areas where we can really reduce costs, reduce waste, uh, you know, and, and, and translate those savings to our customers. Uh, a lot of the millennials now are sensitive about what products or what brands they buy, especially those that are more, you know, more better, better, better companies, better behaved companies. Uh, but yes, uh, it's true. Uh, how do we convince them? Well, you have to have the right products at the right price. And hopefully uh, with, the, you know, with the, the right marketing tools and the right uh, store experience uh, that we offer them, uh, will entice them to patronize responsible companies uh, that puts a lot of emphasis on uh, what's important to them.
Did you keep prices as is or yes. did you have to raise? Well, inflation has been high. Uh, it's now more expensive to buy our goods now or to produce our goods. But it has been uh, maintained at a reasonable level, uh, taking into consideration the afford the willingness of our customers to also pay. So that's important and uh, we should, we're mindful of that too. There's two balancing forces here. When you talk about the fashion industry, it's really, when you talk sustainability, it's carbon footprint on one side where you want to be less on that. But at the very same time, you don't want to be um, diminishing quality or maybe even longevity, if only to make it less of a carbon footprint. So how do you balance these considerations then when you decide where to source and, and how to reduce waste? It's important that we have a very strong partnership with our vendors, with the people that we work with. And I'm proud to say that we have a very strong vendor relations program. We work with our vendors. We uh, work with them on, you know, on, on even in the planning stage so that they don't unnecessarily store up on fabrics or, or, or items that uh, we won't be able to purchase from them. And uh, to my point earlier, I said about uh, disposable fashion. And again, th those are the kind of fashion that I would say that contributes to the carbon footprint because you, know, you don't want to create clothes that people wear only once or twice and then they, they throw it away because the, the, the cost and the resources needed to produce those items is also a lot. So pretty much I think like the, uh, you know, the auto industry, you know, there's hybrid models now, there's gas, there's, uh, there's electric. So in our case, you know, we, we try to keep the balance that we don't want it to be overly priced because our customers won't be able to uh, afford it. But we, you know, we don't also want uh, to sell disposable fashion because that's really not the way to, to, to improve uh, Mother Earth and you know, how we address sustainability as well. Let's talk a little bit bigger now about the industry because a lot's going on. Uh, there's a lot of enabling bills, if you will, uh, a proposed VAT uh, on non-resident digital service providers. And this is very important for those who've begun the retailing industry as brick and mortar, because as we know, physical stores are taxed, but the digital service providers, the online retailers are not. And the proposal is for the proposed value added tax on the non-resident digital service providers to be taxed so that they would not only level the playing field for those with physical stores, but also contribute uh, to the economy. In fact, it's about a hundred billion dollar pesos over yeah. five years, according to the economic team who's uh, thought up about this. What is the retailing industry's thoughts about this uh, perceived bill that might help level the playing field? I think the government should pursue that because it is unfair to those the retailers like us who are paying our taxes and who are taxed in our physical stores. And uh, one thing that this pandemic did, Kathy, was the, flow, you know, was the, was the you know, uh, a lot of these uh, online re sellers came into play. They, a lot of them flourished during this pandemic. Unfortunately, many of them are also not doing their civic duty and they're not paying the right taxes. So the legitimate retailers are the one uh, carrying the cost uh, of government, uh, while a lot of them uh, are not really uh, you know, doing their share. So I think it should be pursued. Uh, I think you should level the playing field, regardless of whether the customer buys it online or offline. I think uh, all, all retailers uh, should contribute and should uh, be taxed equally. And you know, uh, in that way, it's, there's no unfair, unfair trade, no unfair competition. And speaking of competition, foreign competition with the Retail Trade Liberalization Act, that's something that's gone on pre-pandemic. It's still a discussion. But right now, how things have shaped up, what is the industry's thoughts about allowing foreign players to come in by lowering the minimum paid up capital to 25 million pesos, coming all the way from 125 million? Whatever is good for the consumers and whatever is good for the economy, 
and whatever is good for you know the, the country as a whole is good for everyone. Uh, as for me, Kathy, uh, long before this retail trade liberalization law came into play, we've always been competing with the foreign brands. Uh, even long before Panchap started, foreign brands has always been around. So it's an opportunity for local brands to really step up. It's an opportunity for local brands to really play the global game. Uh, I'd like to see the day wherein, uh, regardless of whether you're a foreign or a local brand, uh, you would have the same uh, you know, equal opportunity to be able to serve and to be able to sell to the, you know, to the, to the customers. Uh, that's an ongoing discussion we have with our malls. Uh, uh, that's uh, something that I'm very passionate about. Uh, give the local brands the same equal opportunity to be able to compete with the foreign brands as well, as long as the f local brands are also themselves uh, worthy uh, to be put side by side with all the you know, foreign brands. Uh, I think that is that will come to that point where in uh, whether you know, consumers do not really distinguish whether you're foreign or local. As long as you have the right product at the right price, I think we should all be given the same equal opportunity. But just for the pen shop brand alone, because you're both a local and international business, there's the RCEP. That's the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership that just came through in June. So this is fairly new. And this free trade agreement is seen to benefit uh, a lot of our small and medium-sized enterprises in integrating them into that global value yes. chain that is so important. And we're talking about 14 other countries with lower or zero tariffs. But from your point of view as Pen Shop Group, how do you think this would influence or even impact your business, both locally and internationally? Again, it will give us the same opportunity to access a wider market base. I think we should welcome that. I think we should, you know, we should take advantage of that opportunity, while the foreign brands and those that are coming from those countries is going to look at the Philippines as a huge domestic market. We should likewise look at their uh, home country as a potential market as well. In our pen shop group, we sell internationally through online. Uh, you know, as I said, it's now borderless now. Whether you're Philippine based or you can sell anywhere, anytime. So I think it's it's. It's something that's going to happen. Uh, you know, at, at some point, uh, you know, we will really have to fully participate and take advantage of this opportunity. So, Net, Net, do you think it'll be better for your foreign businesses with RCEP in force? You cannot stop it, Kathy. You know, it's 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 coming. You cannot you cannot you know you cannot stand and you know fight it. You really have to embrace it. Pretty much like how uh, you know digital is is in, in play. You know, you cannot stop it. You know, you cannot stick to analog and you know and insist that the world is not going to change. These things, uh, th these things, you really just have to embrace them. Now let's get to your advocacy because it's, it's interesting. You've chosen a particular group of women micro entrepreneurs, and it's usually mothers in, in your participation card MRI, developing, producing, branding, marketing, and retailing their products. Why the interest? in mothers? Well, I was invited by Dr. Aris Alip, who was uh, you know, a classmate when we went to Harvard together. And I, I'm very uh, impressed by what he's doing to help the micro entrepreneurs, especially the women who are the backbone of the of, of families here in the country. And I've been helping them uh, on a board level, encouraging them on, on you know, what are the opportunities and I think uh, you know it's really raising the you know, the, the Philippine uh, you know, mass to a level where we can really uh, see the country progress to become a stronger middle income uh, you know, domestic market. So, in my own little way, you know, uh, Dr. Ari is a good friend, but uh, in my own way, I, I do hope that I can contribute something to the work that uh, to the tremendous work that he's doing. Now, just before you wrap, you mentioned you are a licensed architect. And we've been talking about you in the fashion industry, so that's a little bit a ways off, one would think. But then again, you made a mention it's both science and art melded together. So if you were to advise the young who's watching or listening right now 
what would you tell them in the way that your journey has presented itself before you? It's not really in building buildings or, or houses, but in building brands. I think you have to believe in the talent of the, of, of the Filipinos. I think you have to be passionate with what you do and never to forget to innovate. I think innovation is not just in terms of product, uh, you know, coming up with great products, but coming up with great business models, coming up with ways on how we can uh, deliver better products, cheaper products, and faster to the, to the consumers, to our customers. So I think innovation is sometimes uh, often overused uh, as reference to just the product, but innovation comes in all aspects of the business. It's not just the front end, uh, that's the architect in me talking, uh, the art side, the sexy part of retail is, you know, the advertising, the one direction, the, 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 uh, the, the billboards that you see and the ads that you see. But bringing those products to life is the science part and that should not be neglected. I think our ability to innovate both the front end and the back end uh, is a way to go, uh, to flourish and to thrive in this business. Just as a follow up, because it's it's a curious name, Pen Shop. And and now that you make a mention of your architectural tilt, is, is there a, a reason why you named it Pen Shop? I started a... I started a business in 1986, Pen Shop, when I just finished uh, college and uh, became an architect. And I was looking for an icon that uh, resonated well with students. And being an architect, pen was a basic tool that I used to draw. So I, I, I kind of used pen as an icon to connect with the young and the students because I'm an architect and I'd like to draw. And we just added the word shop to make it more, more encompassing or to you know, connote that what we're what we were doing, right? So the word pen shop then, uh, I mean, it's, it started as an, uh, as, a, as, a, as an icon or a symbol uh, for students. So that was our market then. And is your market now as well? That's 37 yes. years down the line with pen shop. Thank you yes. so much, Thank Bernie. You. Thank for you for having me. Thank I you for having me, Kathy. Thank you. You're most welcome. And catch us again next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Manila time on One News. You can also check out The Long Conversation on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. I'm Kathy Yang, and this is Thought Leaders.